troops in this region headed in a convoy down to Monto for a land care conference down there where Christine was going to be the headline act. Um, Monto, as you probably know, is a pretty small town and it only didn't have the accommodation for all the delegates at the conference. So they put us all in tents at the local showgrounds and we'd been on an excursion that day to uh, a mixed grain and grazing property that were trying out pasture cropping a la the uh, coal size model. And w after we got back from that day, we were standing outside our tents discussing what we'd seen. And Christine walked past our group and somebody in the group said g'day and she stopped and for the next hour, she just stayed there and chatted to us. And we put all these silly questions to her about carbon in soils because we were rather new to it then. But she very patiently stood there and explained everything to us. And from that I deduced that Christine is a lifetime educator. There's nothing that she likes more than talking to people that are interested in what's going on in their soils and soils. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Christine to the stage. She's not only a lovely person, she knows a little bit about soil. People. That's the thing that I love about it the most. It is about people reconnecting with other people. So I'm going to be talking about microbes and plants and other things today and really about how these guys all talk to each other, about communication in the soil and communication between plants and microbes and plants and insects and plants and animals. Um, but it's the same kinds of, you know, these pathways that have been built over millennia really of how life communicates with other life. It's something that humans are just finally starting to get their heads around and understanding that we all do need to work together and, um, and communicate much more openly perhaps than we have in the past because agriculture has kind of, at one time it was, very much connection with the earth and um, 
I've just come back from Central Europe and I see that very strongly there where, uh, you know, the sorts of agriculture that we used to have at one time where everybody had some, uh, you know, some words have just gone out of my head, one of those little fluffy things called chickens and <laughs> we call them chooks, don't we? I have to learn not to say that word overseas because no one got any idea what a chook is. Uh, yeah, chickens and pigs and, you know, the dairy cow and you grew some crops and you grew some veggies and you had some fruit trees and all that sort of thing, like how we were much more connected with our food, the food chain or our food supply system at one time. And we've really moved away from that. We've gone very much down the track of high input and that has... reading something about, you know, frogs in some, the Everglades in Florida or something, you know, we're no longer able to reproduce. And I think, oh, poor frogs, you know, like all the chemicals in the environment is affecting the frogs. Well, guess what? It's happening to humans now. And that's, that's a big issue, um, obviously, for young people. Um, and not only the issue of fertility, but also the whole thing about, well, you know, what kind of disorders are my kids going to be born with? So we really have to take this very, very seriously. So you might think, that this is irrelevant, talking about microbes, well it's not. Um, because, as I hope I'm going to explain this morning, microbes are running this place and they're responsible for what happens in our gut microbiome. They're actually responsible for our fertility, for our brain function, for our consciousness, for everything that's going on in our bodies. They're responsible for everything that's happening in our plants and our animals and our soils. So we do have to take this uh, very seriously thinking about microbes. Now, if I had one of those little things, you know those things, technical stuff, that's it. Thank you, Julia. <laughs> that's a great one. All right, so let's have a, take a little look at these guys then, a fresh look at microbes. Uh, is that in the way or... Can I move it? Maybe. It's all right, I just have to reorganise the furniture before well, we start. That's all right. No, just so that I've, I've got a clearer view of everybody, that's all. I know some of you will be looking at that screen down there. but uh, Okay, so, clicker. All right. So last year there was a census of life on Earth and somebody with more brains than me figured out that we have 550 gigatons of carbon-based life forms. You just saw a little video about carbon and the importance of it. Um, it's a very important element and, of course, everything that... Just look at that graphically, 
Not that it really means that much, I don't suppose, just to give you an idea of the importance. Life. When we think about living things on this planet, we think about ourselves, I guess, and we think about our domestic livestock and our pets and the wildlife, and we think about insects and fish and other things that live in the ocean and, and on land. Like, well, mollusks include things like, you know, your oysters and pippies and cockles and mussels and all of those, plus your snails and slugs. And annelids include earthworms, nematodes. Some people don't like nematodes. There are humans on the earth. It's really hard to get your mind around these kinds of numbers. And when you see what these microbes do, um, it becomes even more staggering, really, the implications of it, I mean. So just to come back to human health just briefly, and I will mention it again a couple of times in my other presentations today. We have around 100, uh, 1 trillion, sorry, human cells and 10 trillion bacterial cells. So on the basis of the number of cells that are in our body, we are 10% human on a cell count. And then if we look at our genes, if we look at our DNA and what actually runs those cells, we have around 300,000 human genes and we have 100 times more that in bacterial genes. So in effect, we are 1% human. So we're microbe taxis. And that's very well known in the human health uh, circles. That's very well recognised now. Almost every magazine that you pick up about health or anyone you talk to about health will be talking about the human gut microbiome and also, of course, all the microbes that live on our skin and in our hair and everything. But we need to recognise that, yes, we are microbe taxis and, as I said before, so are animals and so are our plants. So in plants, the situation is very similar to that in animals and humans because the cells of the microbes that live in and on your plants outnumber, significantly outnumber the plant cells that are there. So just to reiterate that, there are more microbial cells within plants than... they do it, we see that they are the key drivers for just about everything that happens on this planet, including regulating our atmosphere and a whole lot of other things that I'm not going to go into today. Um, and they can, they can do all kinds of stuff. Now, that's technical, isn't it? They can do all kinds of stuff. But if you think about it, like a bacteria, that, a bacterium, bacterium, I should say, like one little single cell that you'd need a microscope, a high-powered microscope to be able to see it, it can't do anything. One single little cell that you need a microscope to be able to observe, what can it possibly do? It can't do anything. So microbes have to work together. They work collectively, they work cooperatively, and they have to communicate with each other to get their act together to perform the tasks that they do perform. I mean, you even think about it from a 
let's look at it from a pathology point of view. If you get sick with something, if you catch a cold or you catch the flu or even if you get, you know, blood poisoning or something like that, or something that's going to kill you, one single microbe cannot do that. So you have to have millions and trillions of them actually in your body to overpower you. You're, you're a big thing. We might not be that smart compared to bacteria, but we are big. So in order for them to, to uh, overpower us, they, they actually have to be able to talk to each other and communicate and figure out how to, how to outsmart us. So we've always looked at it from that pathology uh, virulence point of view. All the work that's been done on quorum sensing, which I'll mention a little bit later this afternoon, and quorum quenching, has really been, mostly been in regards to human health. But we know that that's how microbes work in all of the environments that they work in. So it's all about communication. And how do they do that? They can't see, they can't speak, they can't hear anything. So if you just closed your eyes for a minute and you thought, okay, I can't hear Christine talking, I can't see anything, I don't know where I am, I can't talk to the person next to me. But together, like if we were all microbes in this room, we're going to do something collectively. And most of the things they do are really beneficial, like fix nitrogen for plants and get phosphorus for plants and all the nutrients that plants need. It's all about microbes communicating with each other. But one single microbe can't do that, so they're going to have to get their act together. So if they can't see, think, hear, whatever, how are they going to do that? What do you reckon? Telepathy. Ah, you might be right. There is actually a lot of telepathy involved and other, uh, other forms of energetic signalling is very, very important in the microbial world as it used to be in the human world and probably we need to get back to that as well. So let's just think about the human body for a little minute and we'll look at this just straight on a biological basis and forget about the energetic signals but we shouldn't forget about them because they are very important. In the human body we have a lot of different organs. You've got your heart, your liver, your spleen, your kidneys, you know, and you've got a brain up. You know, and I'm breathing and, and my heart's beating and all that kind of stuff. So it's all happening in your system because you're working as, you've got all these different organs in your body that are working together, communicating, working as a, as a, sing, as a single organism really. Uh, hopefully you, you would like to think they're all functioning together and how do they do that? There's all these communication signals going on. So we just took one example. Let's say your pituitary, um, which is in your brain, wants to talk to your thyroid, which is in your throat, because it thinks that you're not producing enough thyroid hormone at the moment. Um, so it will send out thyroid stimulating hormone, TSH. Now that hormone has a particular chemical signature that only your thyroid can recognise. So your liver and your spleen and your kidneys and your heart and your lungs and everything, they're not going to take any notice of thyroid stimulating hormone, it's not for them. It's for your thyroid, it's like get your act together thyroid and produce some more uh, T3 and T4. That's what, that's what your pituitary is, talking to your thyroid. But that is going into your bloodstream and circulating through your body and only one organ in your body is taking any notice of that. We're hoping it's taking some notice. And that's how it works in the soil as well. And that's how it works in plants and that's how it works in other animals. That there are going to be signals being sent out all the time. Some some things will have receptors and will pick up those signals. Other things will not see those signals. We're so dumb we don't see the signals, but maybe it's lucky that we don't because there are so many signals out there we would get totally confused. It's probably a little bit like if you think about what's happening in this room at the moment, the room is full of signals that we've generated, like our technology. We've, we've sent, we've, there's phone signals, there's television signals, there's all kinds of things. So if you had a receptor, like some kind of an antenna like your phone, Okay, it's a receptor for if someone sending you a text, your phone can pick up that signal. Won't go to someone else's, hopefully. Uh, if you, you, know, you can switch on the TV and pick up, you can choose which TV channel you want to listen to or you can choose what radio station you want to listen to. So we've got to just dial in to various signals, right? So you, we all understand that this room is full of signals that hum, from human technology. Well, we have to think when we go out um, like tomorrow and the next day or whenever you're out in the field and you're looking at the plants and everything around you, you think they're not talking to each other? 
You think the microbes and the insects and the birds and everything are not talking to each other? Well, don't be silly. Of course they are. But we're just not picking up on the signals. So we have to look and see what those signals are and how we can make those things to be better uh, for our benefit in agriculture. So the plant is a holobiome. Let's talk about plants now. The plant and everything around it, on it, in it, uh, it's all just one big thing, just like we are. And in fact, the whole planet is a holobiome. We have to remember that everything is connected to everything else. We talk about microbiomes, but they don't work in isolation. Our gut microbiome doesn't work in isolation, and neither do your plants. So they have certain areas, though, that we can define, like the philosphere is the area around the leaves. So a leaf is a phyllode. If you're a botanist, you'll know that a leaf is a phyllode. So the philosphere is just all the life that's on, the, on a leaf and all the chemical signals and energetic signals, uh, electromagnetic signals that go out from plant leaves. Then the rhizosphere is the area around the roots. Most of you are familiar with that term if you're uh, into soil biology. And the endosphere is what is actually happening inside the plant. And that's something we're becoming more aware of now. What kinds of biological communications are going on inside a plant. So if we just look at this in a kind of a diagrammatic uh, way, this is not my diagram, I've stolen it from this article here, uh, which is called Chemical Signalling and the Plant Microbe Interactions. But we have a, a green plant, so sorry those of you who can't see the pointer, but I'm sure you can see what I mean. Um, then you've got the soil level and then you've got the roots underneath. So what we know is that there's lots of things happening coming out from the leaves of those plants, from within the plants themselves, and all around the soil. There's massive amounts of communication, because that plant has to defend itself, for a start, from pathogens, just like we do. And it also has to attract beneficial microbes to it, to help it to do all the things that it needs to do, to grow, uh, to thrive, and to even to produce all those secondary plant compounds that it uses for signalling, and of course to get water, to get nutrients. Um, we used to think that plant roots were just like straws really sticking out into the soil, holding the plant in place and sucking up nutrients in a, like an aqueous solution, like, like in, in water. Well, nothing could be further than the truth. That's actually not how plants operate at all. Yes, the roots are there holding them into the soil, but the roots are producing lots and lots of chemical signals to talk to uh, life around the roots. So let's just look at the top part of the plant just very briefly. I really want to talk about the rhizosphere. But if we just look at the philosphere, like what's happening above ground, if we could see the signals, there are massive, massive, massive signalings going out from, from, plant root, uh, from plant leaves. Insects pick up on those really well. If you have a plant with low bricks levels, low health, insects just zone right in on that. If that plant is very healthy and vibrant, high bricks, it's going to be like, don't touch me, don't come near me, I'm not a victim, leave me alone, go pick on someone else. And the insects will just fly straight over those plants. You'll see that happen, I see it happen all the time. You'll see a biologically managed field and next to it there'll be other ones with lots of synthetic ferts and everything, and the aphids and the red-legged earth mite and the locusts or whatever it might be, there'll be different pests in different parts of the world. They're just going to hone right in on the sick plants. Um, so healthy plants will repel those insects. But the other thing I've noticed just recently because um, I've been working in Europe and people have started to stitch in like into their pastures they've started to put in a, in a more diversity and sometimes where there's been like a I know it sounds like I'm a globetrotter but I, I was in Ireland oh we're back on stream thank you don't know what happened there I wasn't meant to tell you that story was I um, but a dairy farmer had was putting in some plantain into his ryegrass pastures. Unfortunately, they've adopted the New Zealand model of ryegrass and synthetic nitrogen, but they've realised that's killing everything, so they're getting off it. But he'd put in some plantain, and he was going to sow the whole paddock, but something went wrong with the planter, and it blocked up or something, and he ended up with just the plantain was down one end of the, the paddock and not the other end. The cows had never been in that paddock before, like never been in it since it'd been sown to plantain. The first time they went in there, they came in through the gate, the bit that they came into didn't have any plantain in it. It was way down the other end. He said he couldn't believe it. As soon as they got through the gate, they bolted and actually ran down to that end of the field and, and ate up all the plantain. So to me, that's a pretty strong indication that cows had never seen plantain before. They didn't know it was there, but they could sense that it was there. So plants put out 
as well as there would be some aromatic signals that they could pick up on, but they pick up very strongly on electromagnetic signals as well, as do insects. And, you know, we think about things like bees and how easily they find flowers and stuff, or well, we know that there's a lot of signalling goes on. You know, when, when a, if a bee finds a flower, she comes back to the hive, tells the other bees about it, and you can really only tell basically the direction to go in. Well, I can't say exactly where that flower was, but when the bee gets somewhere near it, it will actually pick up on the signals that those flowers are giving out. So I just wanted to um, just briefly touch on that and uh, then talk about the rhizosphere. So this is something that we really have to think. Well, we do have to think about the philosphere too, because people spraying out fungicides and insecticides and stuff, really high, you know, high-powered toxic stuff, and you're putting it onto plant leaves. I mean, what are you doing to that signalling? You know, think about what we're doing with the chemicals we use in ag, um, to to how we muck up how plants and insects and things talk to each other. But the rhizosphere, so this is the area around plant roots, a rhizome is a plant root, so the rhizosphere is just that little bit of soil around close to the, the roots. So when we stand on soil, uh, we're not just standing on a pile of dirt, we're actually standing on the rooftop of another world. And there's been more research done into the rhizosphere than there has into, gosh, I'm gonna have to talk faster, into other parts of the, uh, of the soil microbiome, or the, the, micro, the holobiome. But we know that plant communities, and I'm going to talk about diversity later today, we know that plant communities grow far better. Plants in communities, let me put it that way, grow much better than they do plants on their own, or plants grown as monocultures. Um, and that's always been put down to niche complementarity. Like if you have a whole lot of different things growing together, you will get a higher biomass than if you've just got a whole lot of the one thing. Um, and it, one of the reasons that that's been put down to is like, well, we've got different root architecture here. We've got some roots with deep tap root, some plants with deep tap roots, and other ones with shallow fibrous roots. So they're exploring different parts of the soil, and so they're not really competing that much. They're just complementing each other. Well, now that we know that there is a lot more than niche complementarity going on, that there's a lot of signalling going on between those plants, that they're it creates like a super organism under the soil, like a large soil microbiome where everything is connected to everything else. And that soil microbiome actually takes over what happens in that soil. It starts directing traffic, and I'll give you some examples of that. And it starts supporting some of the weaker plants in there um, and, and maintaining that community because that community structure is very important for the things that live in the soil. So if you think about it from the point of view, if microbes are running this place and microbes are pretty smart and they are living in a community underneath a diverse community of plants, it is of their, to their benefit to keep every plant in that community alive because each of those plants is going to have different times of the year when they're going to grow best. And what plants do when they're growing? They're photosynthesizing, they're fixing atmospheric carbon dioxide, they're translocating it down through the root system and out into the soil and feeding the soil. So the energy for all of that life in the soil has to come from a green plant. So if you have lots of different kinds of green plants growing together, photosynthesizing at different times of the year, some things are, are responsive to day length, other things responsive to temperature, other things responsive to moisture, and the more different kinds of plants you have, um, the more chance you've got of having something green basically throughout the year and that means that the life in the soil is going to get fed throughout the year and the life in the soil is not stupid the life in the soil wants to get fed throughout the year so life in the soil will actually move energy around so say um, oh I don't know let me just pick on something chicory is a good example that's one of the plants I really like let's say it's um, actively photosynthesizing and producing lots of root exudates. It's got a lovely big deep root system and there's some, someone next to it, like maybe this little pea here, might not be doing quite so well. Well, the soil microbiome will decide to take some energy from the chicory and give it to the pea, keep the pea alive, because it's going to be to the advantage of the microbiome to do that. So the most well-known symbionts, if you like, in the rhizosphere, the most well-known microbes that live with plants are uh, mycorrhizal fungi. And um, I think that 
video that you were watching was about some kind of a mycorrhizal fungi, is that right? I didn't see the beginning of it. There's lots of different kinds of mycorrhizal fungi, there's hundreds of them, and they're in your soils, so you don't need to add them. Um, so here what you see is like the green leaves of a plant, the black roots are just shown in that diagram, and then all that yellow stuff that looks a bit like spaghetti or something, they're the hyphae of mycorrhizal fungi. So you can see that they extend the root system hugely. Um, they're extremely important for soil, particularly for plants communicating with each other, uh, fending off uh, pathogens, transferring water, transferring nutrients, and sending signals through the soil. So if we have a look at what's actually happening inside a plant root, so mycorrhizal fungi are symbiotic, they're uh, endophytic, they actually do go right inside the plant root itself. So if we take a cross section of a plant root, it looks a little bit like this. And those uh, things that look like little trees or broccoli plants or something in there, they're the arbuscles of arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. And this is a close up of one of the arbuscles. So what happens in with that arbuscle is it's an exchange site. It looks a little bit like an animal's lung, doesn't it? So it's inside a cell, inside a plant root, and what we have is we have carbon um, that the plant has fixed during photosynthesis. So this is the energy that runs the soil system. It's going to go into uh, the little thing that looks like a broccoli plant or lungs in exchange for water and nutrients that are going to come from the arbuscle out into the into the plant cell. So it's an exchange site, just like our lungs are an exchange site. We're exchanging oxygen for carbon dioxide. Inside a plant root, this exchange site is exchanging carbon that the plant is feeding the fungus on carbon because it needs it. it need, that's what it's going to live on is that carbon that comes from the plant. In exchange for that, it's giving uh, water and nutrients to the plants. Now, if we do something silly, like apply a high analysis fertiliser and put it anywhere near our plant roots, the plant doesn't need the things that the mycorrhizal fungi are bringing to it anymore. So under the microscope, you can actually see that that arbuscle will close down. As soon as you put something like water-soluble phosphorus or high analysis in or something anywhere near those plant roots, the arbuscles will do it. The plant will actually shut them down. Say, so I don't need you anymore. I've got everything I need because the farmer just went out and bought it, spent a lot of money on it and wasted most of it because I'm going to talk later this afternoon about how plants probably only get about 10% of what you apply anyway. The rest goes off into the atmosphere or out into the ocean. Uh, so spend a huge amount of money, shut down this communication with microbes and now the plant's left all on its own, uh, basically with no one to talk to and just depending on the farmer to give it a bit more, a bit more nutrients. So we can actually see that happen under the microscope. So what's important is to think about now not only that relationship between the mycorrhiza and the plant cell, but the fact that we have carbon. So that dark stuff that you can see in that uh, photograph is actually carbon that the arbuscle has pulled out of the plant root, and now it's getting siphoned along through the hyphae, through that strand there, that's the, the mycorrhizal hyphae, and it's going to go out into the soil, which is really, really wonderful because the mycorrhiza are one of the main ways that plants can get that energy from the sun out into all the colonies of other communities of other things that live in the soil. So they're the connector. Many times they are the connector between plants and the rest of the soil community. But they do a lot of things beside feed the rest of the soil community. They help enormously with soil structure. And when this photograph shows you a little plant root tip here, just a little dark bit there on the what side's that? On the right hand side. And then all those things sort of looks like a bottle brush or something, but all those hairs or uh, strands coming out from it, they're actually hyphae, hyphae of mycorrhizal fungi. And you can see under the microscope how much that uh, much surface area of that plant root is enlarged by that, which makes it much easier for the root to get water and nutrients that it needs. But it also enables the plant root to um, hang on to soil particles that are around it. So when we see roots that are highly colonised by mycorrhiza, we also see that the soil sticks around the roots. So this photograph here, any of you who are familiar with wheat, um, will know that a wheat seedling doesn't generally look like that um, in a conventionally farmed soil. So when you look at the, when you pull the seed out of the ground, you will, in a conventionally farmed soil, if you've used high analysis fertilizers, you'll see white roots, clean white roots coming out of that 
seed. Well, clean white roots coming out of a seed is not healthy. You should not be able to see the roots. Um, and in this example, you see that there's lots of soil sticking around those roots. That's partly due to mycorrhizal colonisation, and it's also partly due to quorum sensing. And I'll explain that this afternoon about the quorum sensing. So this little wheat plant is actually building soil. And in the other photograph that you can see there, all that soil that's clinging around the plant roots, that is new topsoil that that plant and the microbes living with that plant have built. That what you're looking at there is soil formation. That plant is building soil. And if we look at that under the microscope, we see something like this. All the soil particles being pulled together and the hyphae of fungi holding them together, giving it structure. Now in that photograph you can see that when soil particles are pulled together into little lumps that we call aggregates, there's spaces between the aggregates and those spaces are um, called pores, macro pores. And when we have lots of macro pores in the soil, when it rains, the water can infiltrate really easily. Air can infiltrate really easy, easily. The air is 78% nitrogen. We need that nitrogen getting down into the soil so free-living nitrogen-fixing bacteria can actually um, transform it into a plant-available form. And if we don't have good structure, um, it doesn't matter how much fertiliser you pour on, uh, you're just really not going to get the same response from plants that you will get in well-structured soil. And of course, we lose a lot of the water um, if we have poor structure, and I'll talk about that a little later too. But if we look at this in like a three-dimensional view, you'll see that the, um, the graphic on the right-hand side is well-structured soil. The, ag the soil particles being pulled together into aggregates, and there's lots of spaces. It's like a sponge. The one on the left-hand side is not structured, um, it's lost its porosity and when all the soil particles pack in together like that, when it's like a brick, uh, it's very hard for plants to grow in there, it's very hard for microbes to breathe in there and it's very hard for water to infiltrate. So mi mycorrhizal fungi are very important for soil structure. They're also important for communication. This photograph gets used a lot and that's because it's a great photograph. These are uh, ectomycorrhizal fungi, it's a different kind to the ones that we have in our crop plants. This is on a little pine seedling. These are the ones that form an association with trees. They don't actually penetrate right into the roots, they just grow around the roots. But from this little pine seedling, um, the root area is about the same size as the top area. So you've got that little green bit at the top, which is all there is of the tree, and then a little section of yellow roots underneath that. The rest of what you can see, all that white mycelium, that white cobwebby looking stuff, is, is actually fungal hyphae. And you can see how hugely they have expanded the root system of that plant. And that's just a close up from that photograph. So the bit coming down the middle is the plant root, the rest is, is a hyphae of mycorrhizal fungi. So, you know, great for exploring the soil. But also, all around those uh, hyphae, what we can't see in that photograph are colonies of bacteria that it's, it's like the highway, right? It's, it's carbon channeling out through all of those hyphae, feeding bacteria all around them, and those bacteria are the things that bring to the plant uh, or make available to the plant all the trace elements it needs, like zinc and copper and cobalt and molybdenum and, and everything. They're all going to be uh, accessed by those bacteria that are going to be fed by the fungi. And also the plants communicate with each other. So you've got three pine seedlings there all joined together by mycorrhiza. So that's how they, um, you know, the plant on one side can talk to the plant on the other side or can talk to a plant a football field away just through these mycorrhizal linkages. And that's what we call common mycorrhizal networks. If you're interested in that and you Google that, you'll find probably hundreds of papers these days on common mycorrhizal networks. There's been a huge amount of research undertaken into that, but unfortunately all the research only looks at two species because it's very, very hard to look at 50 things at, at a time and who's talking to who. Um, in fact, all of the research onto microbes has to be very much reduced because of the it gets too complex when you start all the players come in. Um, but this is just like an example from one of the things in the published literature. So this is you know international peer-reviewed science, etc. You'll find a lot of published, good published research on common mycorrhizal networks. But this one is just looking at um, sorghum and linseed. Linseed probably doesn't grow up here. It might be too hot for it. It's a cool season plant. Um, but just looking at the investment of carbon into the system and, um, and the uptake of nitrogen and phosphorus. But what was interesting about that little experiment was when they put them together, 
So on the left hand side you have linseed or flax just growing on its own. On the right hand side you have sorghum growing on its own. And then just look to see what happens. If we put uh, flax and sorghum together, what will happen? Just as a, just a polyculture with only two things in it. And what they found was that the weight of the sorghum increased a little bit, 7%, but the weight of the flax increased 298%, simply by growing in combination with sorghum. So it was hugely beneficial for the flax. And we're starting to see people now um, growing crops together, polycropping uh, poly or combo cropping, they're starting to call it. And that's how Indigenous people always uh, grew crops. If you go to you know many parts of Africa or South America or something, people are still planting things together. They would never plant one thing on its own because there is a huge benefit to having um, different kinds of plants together and it, some combinations are obviously going to be better than others so it's a matter of finding what really works. I saw a great example of this in Ontario in Canada where they were looking at different kinds of crops to grow for cover crops and it was a demonstration farm. The strips were probably about as wide as this room. So if you look very carefully at the photograph and you look over onto the right and over onto the left, you'll see that there's um, something different. And also across the road at the back, there is a something different. So right in the front of us, we have radish, grown as the monoculture, all seed radish. And then next to that, on the right-hand side, there was radish that had just been grown with some oats, some sunflower, and some phacelia. If you're used to what those different things look like, you'll be able to pick out the different leaves. So we've got the radish there, sunflower plant there, oats, hopefully you recognise those, and a little phacelia plant here. So there wasn't much of anything else in there. Um, but this oats growing on its own, even though it had been fertilised, was hugely, uh, sorry, radish on its own, was nitrogen deficient, very clearly nitrogen deficient, and yet right next to it, um, everything the same, same soil type planted at the same time but just with a couple of other species in there, there's no indication of the nitrogen deficiency at all. So if I put those two photos next to each other, um, you can see what a difference that has made. The whole thing is more vigorous. Combination. So farmers who are now polycropping are finding that their yields are far outweighing um, anything that they, they had before. And of course, the Native American Indians knew this for thousands of years because they had what was called the Three Sisters, uh, which is corn, beans, beans and squash. squash, growing together. So when the Spanish armies marched in in the 1500s up there through Florida, what's now Florida, they talked about corn crops that were a mile wide and five miles long. And we're talking about the 1500s, right? No one had tractors, no one had synthetic fertilisers. We didn't have any, or the Native Americans didn't have any technology for planting those crops and they had, you know, like, in fact, there's no corn grown in Florida anymore because the soils there are so poor. Uh, it's just sand, most of it. And um, they thought, how did they do that? Well, it wasn't just corn. They talked about all the corn that they saw, but it was corn, be corn beans and squash. So growing together, uh, they didn't have to fertilise them. And they also, of course, got the advantage of having the beans and squash as well. So the beans grew up the corn, squash runs around all over the ground, and uh, so you've got no big ground anywhere, so you don't have to worry about weeds. And they're all mycorrhizal, and they all link up with a common mycorrhizal network, and they feed each other. So one of the other things that you see a lot about in the literature is what's going on with trees. Gosh. I haven't really got time to explain this. Um, I'm just going to have to talk faster. But they talk about trees helping each other. And what will happen in a system, say, in, in the Northern Hemisphere, where you'll have some deciduous trees and some evergreen trees growing together in a forest. So for an, in this example, we've got a Douglas fir and a paper birch. And what happens in wintertime is that the paper birch loses its leaves. And people who've been looking at what the mycorrhizal fungi are doing in the ground have discovered that the evergreen tree, the Douglas fir, is feeding the paper birch during winter time when it doesn't have any leaves. And I think, well, that's really strange. Why would the Douglas fir want to be keeping the paper birch alive? So it's come down as like this social network of trees. They say, oh, the trees, you know, they really look after each other. Trees, or well, why would a tree care? Why would a Douglas fir care whether a paper birch makes it through winter or not? Um, and then in summertime, when the paper birch has got lots of big leaves and it's photosynthesising much faster than a fir tree can, the paper birch sends carbon through the mycorrhizal network 
to the seedlings of the uh, Douglas fir, which are in the shade, because it's actually it, it's shaded them, because it, you know, leafed up and everything's very shady in summertime, and the little seedlings are all short of carbon. So the mycorrhizal network is actually feeding, um, feeding the seedlings of other species. So you know, people have looked at that and gone, oh, these plants are so benign; they all care about each other. But my question is, well, who is actually directing the traffic here? I mean, who decides where that carbon goes? It's not the trees that decide. They are photosynthesizing and they've got exudates coming out of their roots. They can't decide, I'm going to send it to that uh, paper birch over there or I'm going to send it to that Douglas fir over there. It's the mycorrhizal network under the trees that decides. And why would the mycorrhizal network care? Because in summertime, when the paper birches have got their leaves, they're photosynthesizing.